Have you ever heard of the Fairness Doctrine? Okay, quick digression for everyone who's not a big media history geek. From 1949 to 1987, the Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, the government agency that regulates all non-federal radio and television broadcasting in the United States, had an unusual official policy regarding the broadcast coverage of controversial issues, opinions, and pretty much anything that wasn't a matter of undeniable hard-proven fact. You had to present both sides always, regardless of the issue. In other words, you had to be fair by law. Hence, Fairness Doctrine. Now, in theory, this sounds pretty reasonable. In practice, it was kind of a mess. See, fairness was always kind of hard to quantify as a concept, and many radio stations and TV networks were in constant fear of one side or another of a given issue feeling slighted and filing a complaint of unfairness and then winning, which would lead to a hefty fine for the network. So most broadcasters stayed far, far away from anything politically touchy or otherwise controversial, which is why TV and radio were so bland for so very long. In 1987, the doctrine was officially repealed under then-President Ronald Reagan, which led directly to the late 1980s explosion of issue-oriented talk shows, and is more or less the reason today that every political commentator from Rush Limbaugh to Rachel Maddow has a job. There have been various attempts to revive the doctrine over the years, none of them getting very far, and given that now there's so much more variety of information sources, a much more media-savvy audience, and the outright psychopathy of what sometimes passes for commentary these days, I think it's a discussion worth having. Just not today on this show. Anyway, you'll notice that the so-called Fairness Doctrine lived its whole lifespan before the existence of the Internet, which means it never actually held any sway over the communications tool you're using right now. Well, not officially, anyway. For whatever reason, I blame solar radiation, personally. One can't help but notice that the discourse of popular culture and geek culture, especially on the web, has degenerated into this unholy, abominable thing that I can only describe as a self-perpetuating, crowdsourced mutation of the old Fairness Doctrine, wholly predicated on two utterly asinine assumptions that a depressingly massive number of people seem to have internalized as though they were objective facts. Presumption number one, everything, no matter what, has some specific rival. A Burger King for every McDonald's, a Genie for every Bewitched, a Peter for every Homer, if you will. Never mind that this weird strain of pop culture dualism makes absolutely no sense. It's just there, and it leads directly to presumption number two. All supposed rivals are to be held equal at all times. You must never, ever criticize something without also criticizing its perceived opposite number, or praise something without qualifying said praise with equal praise of something else. Because if you do, you might be a FANBOY! Which is apparently the worst thing you can be called now. If you've ever had any kind of extended interaction in the world of internet forums, you've seen what I'm talking about. It's like there's whole armies of trolls who exist for no other purpose than to brutally enforce this awkward order, making absolutely sure that nothing gets a cookie unless its mirror mirror twin gets a cookie too. Did you like that game, Killzone 2? Well, you'd better think twice before you say so. See, Killzone 2 was a PlayStation exclusive, so if you say you like it, that makes you a Sony fanboy who hates the Xbox. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, you don't think you hate the Xbox? You didn't know that praising something automatically also translates into a deriding of its perceived rival? Well, too bad. That's the way it works. Hey, do you like hip-hop? Well, that means you hate rock and roll. Are you excited for the Green Lantern movie? Hey, didn't you know Thor and Captain America have movies coming out too, you DC fanboy? Now, maybe I'm more sensitive about this stuff, because having opinions on the internet is my job, but am I the only person who realizes what an anti-intellectual cluster f this kind of thinking is? Fanboy used to be, at best, a harmless joke used to poke fun at the more obsessive aspects of nerd culture. Now it's become this sledgehammer for smacking down anyone who dares have an objective opinion. To turn the entirety of web-based cultural discourse into a bland gray sludge of mutual timidity where people are afraid to say anything concrete without a truckload of qualifiers and reassurances. It's gotten to the point where I'd actually think twice about saying I felt like some chocolate ice cream for fear of getting 200 infuriated emails calling me out for my offensive anti-vanilla bias. This madness has got to stop. There has to be an acknowledged and clear difference between asking that people express opinions and engage in debate with civility 
and insisting that we all engage in some grand game of make-believe where there can be no debate because opinion has become a dirty word. Doesn't there? <sighs> I'm Bob, and if you agree with any of that, you are obviously a biased big-picture fanboy.